Good morning, and once again, welcome. This lesson is being recorded for Sunday, August the 21st, 2022, and this is the lesson that will be presented when we assemble at 1050 here in Bellflower, California, at the Rose Avenue Church of Christ. And as is always the case, if you are in our area, we do invite you to come and be with us as we assemble on Sundays at 1050 and at 6 p.m. to worship God. Currently, we are continuing our Bible classes online, and if you're interested in joining us for those Bible classes, uh, certainly you are invited to do so. This coming Sunday, we're going to be finishing up a study of um, the book of Deuteronomy, and then, Lord willing, next Wednesday evening, uh, that is the 24th, I will begin a class dealing with evidences, and our focus is going to be on Jesus as uh, the Son of God and as a historical person. So we're going to look at that and spend a few months talking about why we should believe in Jesus and how to, uh, how to be able to defend the reality of Jesus in, in a world that is so often opposed to the concept that Jesus lives. But let's go on to the lesson at hand for this morning. We are continuing to deal with our, our, uh, our theme for 2022, which is uh, which is drawing closer to God. And we've, we've dealt with a couple of major themes associated with that. We've talked about who God is. We've talked about, uh, uh, we've talked about the grace of God in great detail. And now we are in the midst of an extensive study on the subject of holiness. And we've established the holiness of God. That is the triune God, all three persons in the Godhead and their holiness, and how that ought to lead us to holiness, which of course is where we are at at this time. We've been dealing with the concept of pursuing holiness, which means what can we do to ensure that we are more holy? Now, in the past few lessons, uh, the past couple of lessons, we've um, laid some of the groundwork for this, or actually two weeks ago, we laid the groundwork by basically talking about how we need to be devoted to God. There needs to be pure devotion there. We need to be a faithful servant of God. And we need to understand what it means to be separate and to live lives of purity. And of course, if we do those things, it's going to affect every aspect of our lives. It's going to affect the way we think. It's going to affect our attitude. It's going to affect who we are. It's going to affect what we do, how we talk, where we go. Uh, and you can just go on and on down the list. In other words, it's going to be the essence of who we are. And that's why last week we started looking at those areas. And we started with the area of attitude. And we noted a number of attitudes that, uh, that will help us to promote holiness in our lives. Number one, you need to have this determined attitude. There needs to be determination there. We need to have a heightened reverence or respect for God, something that has come up all throughout this study on holiness. We talked about the importance of love. Loving God and loving others. We talked about our need to be content, our need to be thankful, our need to be humble, or our need to be one uh, who is peaceable, pursuing peace with others. We need kindness. We need impartiality. And that leads to what I want to talk about today, which is associated with the idea of, um, of our attitudes. But I want to focus a little more on what I would describe as our disposition. And that's the direction that we're going to go in this particular lesson. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, you may recall last week we described what, or we defined the word attitude, because I always like to begin my lessons with definitions. And, and this, the same thing is true here, and I, I'm hoping we'll see just a, the, the, slight, the slight distinction that exists between disposition and attitude. I'll tell you right now, they're very much related to each other. But when I think of the disposition, um, I think of who we are overall. The word is actually defined as a prevailing tendency, mood, or inclination. Uh, the, your temperamental makeup, or the tendency to act in a certain manner under given circumstances. And as I've noted, while that is related to our attitudes, our disposition basically yeah, it's deep down who we are. Uh, and, and our disposition is going to affect our attitudes. It's, it's going to affect the way that we approach whatever situations come. You may recall last week, 
when we were talking about attitudes and so on, you know, we pointed out how we need all the all those attitudes, and they, they go hand in hand. In the same way that in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23, that, that Paul there describes the fruit of the Spirit as love, joy, peace, long-suffering, self-control, and various other things that he mentions in that particular text. And what we emphasize is that term fruit of the Spirit. It's not fruits of the Spirit, as in many fruits. It's a fruit. If the fruit of the Spirit is in you, all those qualities will be prevalent. And that's the idea of our disposition. Our disposition is going to shape all of our attitudes, and it's basically going to going to direct all of our attitudes in one direction as opposed to another direction. We talked a little bit dealing with attitudes last week about good attitudes and bad attitudes and how typically there are those who have good attitudes with most things and they're pleasant to be around and, and they approach circumstances in a good and a positive way. But then there's those who have negative and bad attitudes and, and, and it basically reflects in just about every aspect of their lives. And quite honestly, you try to avoid those individuals. Well, friends, that's your disposition. That's who you are deep down within. And that disposition is going to control the types of attitudes that you have. Now, what I want to do this morning is I want us to notice four qualities that are associated with our disposition. And this is by no means an exhaustive list. As a matter of fact, I, I actually um, had a list of seven of them, and, and I'm just going to mention the others at the end and, and uh, just kind of commend this to your thinking and maybe for future studies. But nevertheless, I want us to understand that if we have a good disposition, it's going to affect qualities that deal with everything in our life. And I want to talk about four of those in this lesson. So let's go ahead and get started with that. The first one that I want to talk about, and obviously this is one of those fundamental things. These are all fundamental, as a matter of fact. But the first thing that I want to talk about is I want to talk about integrity. And I want to talk about the importance of integrity in our lives. Now, when we see that word integrity, what comes to mind is the idea of steadfast adherence to a strict moral or ethical code. And from a spiritual standpoint, I want you to notice the moral and ethical code. You, uh, you, you have a moral code about you, and everything that you do is governed by that. It's the state of being unimpaired or, or soundness, and that idea of soundness is to be healthy. Number three, the quality or condition of being whole or undivided, complete. If you have integrity, it's going to be, it's going to just be consistently there. And that's kind of the point. And we'll see that as we develop this. You know, integrity, it's about living a life of consistency that is based upon God's word. You know, it's not, uh, you, uh, if, if you have integrity, you're not living a double life as it is sometimes described. And what a double life means, you live one way sometimes and you live a different way at other times. And, and the problem with living the double life, not only is it hypocrisy, but constantly the two different lives are at, at odds with each other. They're struggling with each other, and they're, they're, they're fighting to gain overall control of you. And friends, I'll tell you right now, that leads to a miserable life. Integrity is, is, is about uh, remaining steadfast, and, and you're in a circumstance where you are not going to fall apart when um, pressures and, and challenges arise. And, and I remember a number of years ago um, hear, hearing a lesson that, that, that compared integrity to that of, um, of an aircraft. And, 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 and the point is, is when you look at the integrity of that, uh, that, that aircraft, uh, you know, you're sitting there, you're flying in the air, and if you know anything about atmospheric pressure, you know that the higher up you get, the, the, uh, the stronger the pressure is. And basically, when airplanes are flying in those higher altitudes and, and in places where there's extreme pressure, you want that plane to have enough integrity where it will not crush, where it will not fall apart as it is in the air. That's the idea of the integrity of an aircraft. The same thing is, is true with a ship. When everything is designed and put together 
properly, it's going to remain uh, intact even when extreme pressures are placed against it. Well, think about that in terms of, of spiritual thoughts. We, when we are faced with challenges, when our, when our faith is challenged, when, when our way of life is challenged, when, our, when our, our code of ethics is challenged, do we give in or do we uh, and fall apart? Or do we maintain our integrity in everything that we do? The Bible continually talks about the subject of integrity. For example, you can go over to the book of Job, and you remember how Satan appears before the Lord, and as the Lord says, you know, have you considered my servant Job? And of course, Satan in chapter 1 says, well, you've given him everything he wants. No wonder he serves you. You take it away from him, he'll curse you. And of course, Satan was permitted to take everything away, but Job remained faithful. And that's when Satan appears a second time. And just, just for the point of our lesson, not to go through the whole account of Job, you read in verse number 3 of Job chapter 2. It says, The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, and still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him, to destroy him without cause. He holds fast to his integrity. After he lost everything in his life, he continued to praise God. And that's an example, a great example of integrity. If you want an example of a lack of integrity, I would go to the, I would go to the religious leaders that Jesus was constantly challenging. In Matthew chapter 23, as Jesus begins this, this, uh, this sermon, and I've heard uh, this described as the sermon that crucified Jesus. And in reality, this you might call it the straw that broke the camel's back, where Jesus was ready to carry on with what needed to be done. And this is the way he begins this strong, scathing rebuke of these hypocrites. He says in verse 2, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works. For they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen a man, and he goes on and describes that. Notice how Jesus said, they, they bind heavy burdens on you, but they won't lift it with one of their fingers. They're hypocrites. They don't have integrity as they, as they, as they teach the law. It's, it's not like they're saying, you know what, look at what I'm doing in these areas. They would demand things of others and wouldn't do it themselves. That's hypocrisy, folks. In Matthew 15, on another occasion where, because uh, 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 Jesus would not follow their traditions, I want you to know, they, it was not about following the law of Moses, but their traditions, and they challenged Jesus on one of those occasions, and Jesus goes on and he challenges them about transgressing the commandments of God because of their traditions. And then he goes on and, and he quotes from Isaiah and he says there in verse 7 of, I, of uh, Matthew 15, Hypocrites, well did Isaiah say, or prophesy about you saying, These people draw near with, you, with me, draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching his doctrines, the commandments of men. Notice how Jesus said, you know, quoting from Isaiah there, that they, they uh, draw near to me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips. Oh, when you listen to what they say, it sounds like they're the most faithful people in the world. But their heart is far from me. They're hypocrites when that is the case. And friends, that's a lack of integrity. Peter, over in 2 Peter 1 and in verse number 5, as, he, as he's describing about building our faith, he says there, add to your faith, or giving all diligence, add to your faith, or within your faith supply, virtue. And then to that you add knowledge and you go on from there. That word virtue, while I know it's not exactly the same thing as integrity, I associate it with 
integrity. Because the idea of that word is, is that of a moral excellence. And basically what it is saying is you are a person who is virtuous, who has integrity, and you have enough integrity that as you study the Word of God, by faith you're going to do what the Word of God tells you. If you don't in have integrity, you might try to explain that away. And that's not the way that we are to be. In Titus chapter 2 and in verse number 7 and in Titus chapter 2, Paul is sitting there describing you know, everybody in terms of young and old, male and female, and, and just describing young men, and I think it applies to all. He makes the point to these young men that they be sober-minded in all things, showing yourselves to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, and he goes on from there. But he says, in doctrine, you are to show integrity. In other words, you, you do what God tells you to do. That's integrity. And you follow his commands as they, are, as they are directed toward you. And you're willing to do whatever he tells you to do. The Proverbs give us numerous illustrations associated with this. For example, in Proverbs 11 and in verse 3, Solomon there says, The integrity of the upright will guide them, but the perversity of, un of the unfaithful will destroy them. Those who are of integrity, they will make sure that their integrity guides the decisions that they make, regardless of the consequences. Another proverb of Solomon, Proverbs 21 and verse 3, to do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. You've got the idea of one who is doing righteousness and justice, and I think uh, integrity, is associated, integrity is associated with the idea of that righteous injustice that is in that particular text there. And so he's, he's going to be somebody who's going to be uh, pleasing to the Lord in every way. In Hebrews chapter 13 and in verse 18, the Hebrew writer said, Pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things, desiring to live honorably. I think some versions use the word with integrity instead of honorably there. And the idea of living, if you think about it, if you're living in an honorable way, you are living with integrity in your life. And typically when people live with integrity, they are respected by most. Now I realize those who are outright enemies and, and those who are uh, exposed by the uh, by one's integrity, obviously they're not going to be interested in following after you, but everybody else will, and the majority will respect you, even if they don't agree with you. The fact that you have integrity goes a long way, and that's why we need to be pursuing integrity in our lives. And uh, some of the ways that integrity is described, and, and this was based on a lesson that as I was preparing this, the one who lives with integrity, number one, he's going to align the principles that govern his life based upon truth. Uh, our integrity that we're interested in is integrity based upon the Word of God. We're talking, about, we're talking about being Christians. There are people that live this world with integrity based upon whatever the standard is that they follow. And they're honorable people, but they're not saved. They're not Christians because they're not following the Word of God. Our interest is in spiritual matters. So when we talk about integrity, it needs to align the principles that govern our life based upon what God's principles are. Secondly, he will be consistent between his principles and his conduct. In other words, he's going to live the way that he knows he ought to be living. And third, he's going to be consistent both publicly and privately. This is oftentimes where double lives come in. People live one way when they're around others, and they live a different way when they're by themselves or in some type of a private circumstance. That's not living a life of integrity. If you have integrity, you're going to do what is right even when no one else is watching because you know that God is watching, and you know it's the right thing to do. You know, I think about David. When I, when I see these things. You know, in Psalm 26, we have a, a powerful Psalm of David, and I love what he says here. He says here, Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. 
I have also trusted in the Lord, I shall not slip. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my mind and my heart, for your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. You know, I always, I, I've always wondered as I see things like this, verses like this. Notice how David said, I want you to try my mind and my heart. You know, that's an interesting thing to think about. How many of us really want God to judge our minds and our hearts? Not our outward appearance. You know, not the fact that we show up faithfully to, to worship services and there's, uh, we control our tongue and there's things that we do and we associate with our brethren. So, but inside, do we really want God judging us based upon who we really are? And by the way, he is going to. But here, but, but David is saying, I've walked with integrity. You know that. I'm not afraid of you judging my motives. I'm not afraid of you judging who I am at all times, especially when no one else is looking. What a powerful statement that is. A little later on in uh, Psalm 101 and verse 2, David again would say, I will behave wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. And some versions there say with integrity. I will walk within my house with integrity. Now, what's interesting about this is I want you to notice how David in this verse, he declares that he can control his heart. He, he can control the way that he walks. He can, he can control whether or not the way that he walks is consistent with who he really is, and what God wants him to be. And so you find something about what we need to be when we think about that. So that's the idea of holy, of, 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 of uh, integrity. And if you're pursuing holiness, you're going to have integrity in your life. But let's talk about another quality here for a few moments. And there's actually two, two qualities that are actually tied together here. And the first one is that of being sober or soberness. Now, the idea of that word sober is a mind, and I'll add to that your body, being free of intoxicants. If you're sober, there's not something that is impairing who you are physically and or mentally. We know that the body can become intoxicated, and when that happens, your mind is impaired by that. We see it all the time, and the news quite often reports on the results of those who have impaired um, bodies because of they've ingested alcohol or drugs or other things that have caused them to live recklessly. And then they do things that have consequences both for themselves as well as for others. But I want you to understand that soberness can also apply to our spiritual minds. We need to be sober. You know, over in uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 4 and in verse 23, Solomon there said, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Jesus in Mark chapter 7 and, and in verses 18 through 23 there, he was, he, was talking about, he was talking about the things that come out of the mouth, how they defile a man, because they're from the heart. And he describes all these evil behaviors and he says uh, if these things are being done uh, um, they come from an evil heart they come from an impure heart if you will and so I want you to understand that our hearts can be impaired spiritually so why do I need to be sober when it comes to serving God well, I need to be sober because as a Christian I need to be alert and friends, I want you to understand that I always need to be alert. And when we say being alert, what I mean by that is you are aware of what is going on. You are aware of your surroundings. You are aware of circumstances. You are aware of Satan and what he is up to, and you are not ignorant of his devices. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and about verse number 11. And... Uh, you are aware of how he uses others to do his work, to do, to do his bidding, if you will. And, 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 and I need to be alert to those things. I need to be aware of how what is happening around me 
can influence me. And the steps that I take, the results and the consequences that will come from taking those steps. That's what soberness is about. And if I'm pursuing holiness, I'm going to want to be of a sober mind at all times. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and in verse 8, Peter there said, Be sober and vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You be alert, and you be awake, and you be aware of what is going on. You be vigilant. You might tie that to being diligent in your awareness. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 6 through 8, we find here that Paul is, is talking about the way that we live our lives again. And he makes the point there in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 6, let, Therefore let us not sleep as others do. Obviously he's not talking about physical. But what he is saying there is, But let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. So Paul is there making the point that we don't live as those of the night. We need to live as, as in the daytime spiritually. We need to be awake. We need to be mentally aware of what is going on. We need to be aware of our surrounding. And we need to prepare to engage in battle with Satan. We need a spiritual battle. We need to be ready for that. In Titus chapter 2 and in verse 11, Titus said, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness, we should live, or uh, and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. We need to live sober, soberly, righteously, and godly in our lives. In Romans chapter 12 and in verse number 3, Romans 12 and in verse number 3, Paul there in that text tells us not to be prideful. And he says, I say through the grace of God given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. We need to think soberly. We need to be sober in our lives. And so that's a quality that we need if, we're, if we are to be pleasing to God. Now, associated with being sober is being serious. And, and as a matter of fact, sometimes when you talk about somebody being sober-minded, oftentimes it means that they're serious in the way that they're living their lives. They're not being flippant about what is going on. And, and you can think of the example of the qualifications of an elder in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 2. He has to be sober minded. This is one who is thoughtful and he's restrained in his words and his actions. He thinks before he acts and this is not somebody who's going to act flippantly and impulsively and, and recklessly in the decisions that he makes. They're going to be carefully thought out and he's going to, he's going to watch his steps. He's going to guard where he goes because he's serious. This is somebody that is not flippant or, or half-hearted as he does what he does. And he knows what is truly important, and that is what's guiding the direction that he's going to go. So he's serious as he lives his life for the Lord. Now, just like we are called upon to be sober, we are called upon to be serious. Over in 1 Peter chapter 4 and in verse number 7, 1 Peter 4 and verse number 7, Paul there said, You be serious and watchful in your prayers. Over in um, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and in verse number 13, Peter there said to us, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Now we are talking about holiness, pursuing holiness. 
Notice how he says to do this. You gird up the loins of your mind. And what he's saying there is you be serious in the way you live your life. You tighten up your mind and, and you, you just make sure that you're going the direction that you're supposed to. And what's interesting about this verse is he says you gird up the loins of your mind. You act seriously in what you're doing and you be sober. So you, they're tied together. But there's a slight a bit of difference between the two of them. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15, doesn't use the word soberness there, but it's, it's interesting as, as Paul there says in verse 15, where he makes the point there, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as wise but as fools, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. The idea of walking circumspectly is, is being alert, being aware of what is going on. You might think of the soberness that we talked about in the last one, but it's also the idea of you're doing that with a serious mindset. And as a result of that, you're using your time wisely. You realize what your time is, and so you're not going to waste away your life and be flippant with the use of your time. You know, I think of the example of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and I realize here he's talking about uh, a time coming when spiritual gifts would be done away, miraculous spiritual gifts, if you will. And, and uh, of course, he uses an illustration there. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Friends, we need to be serious. Spiritually, we need to grow up. And we need to reach a point where we are grown up spirit, spiritually. And if we are pursuing holiness, there's going to be a seriousness in the way that we live our lives as Christians. Friends, I have serious concerns about this. But we're living in a society that is less than serious about so many things. And that is especially true from a spiritual standpoint. Yeah, there's, there, there's material things going on that there are some who are serious about them. Uh, but, but look at how much of our society is driven around entertainment and people wanting to be entertained all the time. And we're living in a society that is seeking constant amusement. And I'm fearful that sometimes we get caught up in that ourselves. And, and, and I'm not saying that amusement is wrong, provided it is good, clean amusement. But the point is, is, is that's not the whole premise of life. But here's the sad reality, is there are churches that are catering to this. And some of the largest and most expanding churches now are those that, that they're catering to the, the superficial, worldly, materialistic mind. Those that want to be entertained. And so they've decided, you know what? We need to cater our worship to those who want to be entertained. So we want to make our worship more entertaining. And that's what worship has become in so many places. And friends, I want to tell you right now, if, 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 if a church has the focus of, of entertaining people in one way or another, whatever that is, the seriousness of the gospel is going to suffer because of that. You may grow in number as a result of that. But many of that number, and I realize there's exceptions, but many of that number, the only reason they're going to be there is because of the food, because of the fun, because of the frivolity. And Jesus talked about that in John chapter 6. And when he told them the truth, many of them left him because uh, he, they, weren't, uh, they weren't getting another free meal from him, if you will. Friends, we need to realize what Paul told Timothy over in 2 Timothy chapter 4, where he told him, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure for themselves, or where they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. They're going to hear what they want to hear and they want their ears scratched. They want to be entertained. Friends, if you're pursuing holiness, that's not what it's about. I want to tell you that right now. 
Now, friends, I have no problem with entertainment. And, and, and I believe, you know, as you read over in Ecclesiastes 3 and in verse 4, that, that there's a time to laugh. There's a good time for laughter. And I think we ought to have a, a, we ought to have a glad and a, a joyful disposition about us spiritually and so on. And friends, when I talk about being serious, uh, that doesn't mean that I can't have fun. That doesn't mean that I cannot joke around. God wants us to enjoy life. He gave us what is on this earth for our pleasure, for us to enjoy. So friends, there's nothing wrong with enjoying life. And you know what? There, there are some people, you know, I, I know some gospel preachers who who are hilarious to be around. And, and you know what? You look forward to you look forward to being around them. You look forward to those times when you're going to see them again because you know that the way they're going to live their lives, is when they enter the room, they're going to brighten the room and they may do it uh, jovially. You know, they, they, they may do it with, uh, you know, jokes and, 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 and they've just got that quick-witted humor where they can say what needs to be said. I'm going to tell you right now, there are some of them, while they may be that way, when it comes to God and his word, they know when to turn that off and when to be serious. That's what we really, really need to think about. We need to get serious. You know, I'm, again, I, again, I'm reminded of Solomon over in the book of Ecclesiastes. And, and, and what he said there to young people at the end of Ecclesiastes, let's go ahead and read this real quick. In, in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, and what you find there in verse 9. Talking to young people, you read, Rejoice, O man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes. Okay, so, you know, live your life to its fullest. Enjoy life while you're young. But then he goes on, But know that for all these, God will bring you in to judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from your heart and put away evil from your flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. Remember your Creator now in the days of your youth. You think about God as you live your life. You enjoy yourself. But whatever you do, you just realize one day God's going to hold you accountable for what you do, the way that you live your life. Friends, we need to be serious. Life, serious. And so is eternity. That brings me to the final disposition that I want to talk about this morning. And as I said, there's many more. I want us to think about this for a minute. And that is self-control or self-discipline. To live a dedicated life requires hard work. It requires a focused mindset and a willingness to make sacrifices when needed. We need to focus on God and on spiritual matters even when we are facing distractions and when distractions come our way. And friends, I want to tell you right now, given enough time, distractions are going to come. We need to have the self-control and the self-discipline to not let those distractions draw us away from God or keep us from pursuing holiness in our lives. Now, I tie these two words together, but in reality, I realize that they're a little bit different in meaning, and, and we know they're tied together. They work together to accomplish the way that you ought to live your life. If you were to make a distinction, some would describe self-control as self-restraint over your impulses, your emotions, and your desires. Basically, uh, you know, you know self-control is, is the mind. Is the mind that stops you from doing something that you ought to be, uh, that, you, that you know you shouldn't be doing. That's the idea of self-control when you think about that. There's a restraint there that causes you to not lose your temper when you get angry and those kinds of things. Self-discipline is the control of ourselves where we do what we're supposed to do. 
In other words, we do what we need to be doing and we don't do what we don't need to do. Self-discipline causes me to, to watch where I go, uh, who uh, the, the way that I talk, and just everything about my life. I discipline. It'll it'll cause me to to do the things I need to be doing um, because I know I need to do them, even if they're not pleasant, but they just need to be done. And that's the point. And, and understand that that uh, you know when you see these two terms, I, I realize they complement each other, and sometimes we use them interchangeably, and 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 rightfully so. I mean, because they are so tied together. And, you know, I I think of the way that they complement each other. Kind of in the same way that the terms grace and mercy uh, uh, apply to God. You know, you know, we've talked about, you know, what is the difference between grace and mercy? You know, grace is giving us what we do not deserve. Uh, mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. And they go hand in hand with each other. And the same thing is true with self-control and self-discipline. Self-control keeps us from doing what we shouldn't do, while self-discipline causes us to do what we need to be doing as we live our lives. So that's the distinction between the two. And both of them are dealt with in Scripture. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 5, where we talked about virtue a few moments ago, uh, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control patience, to patience godliness, godliness to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love. You add to your faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control. We need self-control in our lives. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 beginning in verse 1, Paul describes the, the perilous times of the last days. And I, I describe this as a list of selfishness. And, and among the, the things that are said in verse number 3 is they are without self-control. The book of Proverbs, again, deals extensively with this. In Proverbs 29 and in verse 11, you read there, A fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. Proverbs 14 and in verse 29 tells us, He who is slow to wrath has great understanding. But he who is impulsive exalts folly. We need to not be impulsive. We need to have self-discipline and self-control in our lives. We, we abstain from every form of evil. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 2 Timothy chapter 1 and in verse number 7 you read there, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a, a sound mind. Now, the English Standard Version uses the word self-control in place of a sound mind. It's tied, to, it's tied to those things. A sound mind is going to cause you to have self-discipline or self-control in your life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and in verse number 12. Interesting passage here. Paul doesn't use the word self-control, but notice what he says. He says, all things are lawful for me. But not all things are helpful. All things for, are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any of them. I'm not going to let something else control me. I'm going to be in control of what I do and make sure that I don't lose control of my life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where uh, Paul describes love, he says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not behave rudely. Love does not envy. Love does not uh, uh, parade itself, is not puffed up, does not seek its own, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, never fails. Those are all associated with love. It, and, and they show self-control in your life. In James 1 and verse 19, James says, Let everyone be swift to hear, Slow to speak and slow to anger. That's self-control. Or in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, an interesting passage where uh, Paul there said, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with that temptation will also make the way of escape. 
Now, the point I want you to understand here is Paul is saying there's no temptation that you have to give in to. If you give in to temptation, it's by your choice. And the point I want us to understand is we can control ourselves. We can control our decisions. We can control what we do and what we do not do. But it requires self-control on our part to be able to do that. So we need self-control. But we also need self-discipline. And again, yeah, they're related. But turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and here Paul talks about an athlete. Something he did quite often. Something uh, the Corinthians could relate to. He said, do you not know that those who all run in a race... Or all run in a race, but one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. You run to win. Spiritually, you run to finish and be rewarded with heaven when this life is over. Goes on in verse 25. Looking at uh, material or physical athletes, he said, everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. He has self-discipline in his life. He's in control of what's going on. Now they do to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. Paul here says, I discipline my body. Friends, that's self-discipline. I put my body to the prep, to the test. I do what I need to do, even the hard things. I do whatever it is that I have to do to make sure that I'm right with God and so that when I stand before him, I will not forfeit my salvation. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we're told there to lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us and run with endurance the race that is set before us. As I've noted on numerous occasions, uh, life is not a sprint. This, the, the life of a Christian is a, it's a marathon. And it's not going to be finished until we cross the borders from life into eternity. We have to endure. And all of that requires self-control, self-discipline on our part. In Galatians 6 and in verse number 9, Paul there said, Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not lose heart. Or another way of saying that, it, we'll win if we don't quit. If we don't give up. When it comes to self-discipline, self-control, any verse, any verse that gives you instructions, and I call it positive instruction, in other words, it's giving you direction, uh, even something not to do, it, it's positive from the standpoint of, uh, 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 positive from the standpoint of this is, this is what I'm telling you how to live your life. Any verse that gives you that calls for self-control, and it calls for self discipline in your life. In Hebrews 5 and in verse 12, the writer there re re lovingly rebuked them saying, by this time you ought to be teachers, but you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracle of God. He rebuked them because they had not practiced self-discipline and, and, and disciplined themselves to learn as much of God's word as they ought to have known by that time. That's why he says in chapter 6 and verse 1, therefore let us go on to perfection. In Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse number 31, Paul says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put, on, uh, put away from you with all malice. Friends, there's your self-control. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. There's your self-discipline. You be kind to others, even those who are not kind to you. You forgive. Talk about self-discipline. Learning to forgive. Maybe it's somebody that doesn't deserve your forgiveness, but they need it. Kind of like you need God's forgiveness even though you don't deserve it. We need self-control and we need self-discipline in our lives if we are to be pleasing to God. Friends, I want you to understand that pursuing holiness is not an easy thing to do. It requires self-discipline and taking control of everything in your life. You're even to bring your thoughts into captivity to the obedience of Christ. 
So there are some qualities that are associated with the disposition of a Christian that, that will help promote holiness. And I could add others to these. I, we could talk about patience. We could talk about courage. We could talk about uh, tenacity. And what that means is uh, not giving up. We could talk about all those things, but, uh, but I'm just going to commend this lesson to you. Understand that we, the ones we've examined, they're sufficient to help us understand that pursuing holiness is based upon who we are within. And here's a final note as I wrap this up. I want you to understand that while faithfully serving God and living your life and, and developing a disposition that ought to be, you can change. Even if your disposition is not what it ought to be right now, you can change. Because that's the power of the gospel. It is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of, of, of joints and marrows and of soul and spirit, and a, spirit and is a, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. If you will learn the gospel and you will begin following after what the gospel says, you can be transformed. You can be changed. And you can be changed not super, just superficially. You can be changed deep down. You can be changed where your disposition is is concerned. You know, I'm reminded of 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 11 where Paul gives this list of those who will not inherit the kingdom of God and he says, such were some of you. But you've been washed, you've been sanctified. You're not like that anymore. Or as we've been talking about in 1 Peter chapter 4, we dealt with this not too long ago where uh, Peter there said, we've spent enough of our time living the ways of the Gentile and he describes uh, unsober behavior, among other things. Then in verse 4, he says, In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same dissipation, speaking evil of you. And the point is, is they look at you and they can see that you've changed. You're a different person now than you were before. So, friends, I want you to understand the power of the gospel. It is powerful enough to change us if we're willing to be changed because it's only going to happen if that's what you genuinely want to do and that's why i simply ask the question do you have a holy disposition are you pursuing holiness with everything that you are think about that and the lesson is yours and if you would please bow with me at this time our dear god and our Heavenly Father, once again, we come to you. And as always, we are so thankful that you bless us in so many ways. We are thankful for the freedoms that you've given us. And we are thankful for all that you've given us that pertains to life and godliness. We are thankful for our spiritual blessings, the hope that we have. We pray that you will help us to never take that for granted. And dear God, help us to pursue holiness. Help us to develop attitudes and a disposition that will promote holiness in our lives, even in the difficult times. And help us to remember that each and every hour of each and every day. Go with us through this day and through the remainder of our week. Help us in all that we do to put our trust in you. We ask this in Jesus' name, and amen. And again, thank you for listening to this lesson. Hopefully you have found something of benefit uh, as you give consideration to the way that you live your life. Just know that serving God is something that takes place, starts in the heart, starts with who you are. And if, if you are not who you ought to be, do what you need to to change that. And if there's some way that I can help you, let me know. So with that in mind, I commend this to you and, and, and bid you farewell and have a good day and a good rest of your week. And bye-bye.